Good morning. I trust that you're going to enjoy this Sunday and you're going to enjoy this message. It's a privilege for me to come and serve you with the good news of Jesus. I would like for you to know that you are valuable to God and that he has come and brought forth people in the earth and gifts in the earth to serve the people whom he dearly loves. You are his bride. You are his wonderful, wonderful children whom he dearly loves and whom he wants to uh, give access to his quality of life. And that is why I'm here today, to minister the good news of Jesus Christ to you. It's a great privilege to serve you this morning. Let us just pray together as we start our Sunday service. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you speak powerfully through me today as we, as I'm recording this message in the hope that every person would hear your message of love and grace. I thank you, Father, that you love people dearly, and you would speak powerfully through me today and in, encourage your people so they could have a broader understanding, a deeper understanding of what you have dreamt for all of us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. <laughs> today we're continuing to read from Ephesians chapter 3. And we're talking about powers and principalities. I think this is the third or fourth Sunday that we're talking about this. And I'm going to continue to talk about this and just take the scripture a little bit further where we're going to talk about the eternal purpose that God had with us in Jesus Christ and the boldness and the confidence that we can have in him. As most of you know, we are preaching through Ephesians and we are busy uh, with Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. The concept of powers and principalities is something that is very interesting and something that I do believe that each one of us truly have to understand. So many times we have been taken up with demons and the devils in such a great way that we start to stop, yeah, we start to forget that it is about the kingdom of God that manifests on earth and that the true power and the true principal thing or true principality is Jesus Christ himself is God's rule and reign in the earth through the man, Jesus. So many times when we think of people, or not people, demons that are in heavenly places, we are thinking that it is only the unseen realm when we think of heavenly places. But the scripture says that we as the church, we are co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies or in heavenly places. So, uh, when we think of heavenly places, it does not exclude physicality. It doesn't exclude us. I want to tell you that you are uh, in heavenly places. In other words, as one would look at powers and principalities as pertaining to what Paul was addressing here, and we're going to look at some of the Greek of these words and jump to Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 and go deeper into this. As we look at this, we cannot but conclude, as I've mentioned also in our previous Sunday service, that we as the church are also a power and a principality. It doesn't have to mean that it is demons. Now, it can include demons, and demons are also in that structure, but that is just one small part of the whole concept of powers and principalities. Uh, when we start to know it for what it truly is, we will start to see that the physical resurrection of Jesus and the rulership of God in the earth, wherein the kingdom of God has started to manifest its life in this earth, when we, we will see that as the victory that there is uh, in the earth. And we will start to see the powerful manifestation of the kingdom of God and what it means for us today as something that is greater than what any demon can ever do. Now, these are uh, complex concepts, and it is not really as, uh, that complex, but what has made things complex is what was made of something that is very, very simple. Let me give you an example, and I've mentioned this before, but let me just refresh your mind. If God decides to make man from the dust of the earth, and he wants to give man eternal life, which simply means that this person would live forever and never die, like in the case of Jesus. And we then find a devil coming in saying that you cannot surely die. 
And then we find that man dies, but man can still not believe that he can surely die. And now we find uh, Greek philosophy coming into play, wherein man is divided into compartments of spirit, soul, and body, and so forth. And now the soul lives on, and the spirit lives on, and the body now dies. Uh, and now we have to deal with all of this. A very simple thing has now become very complex on account of unbelief in what God has said. So many times uh, something is complex, not on account of God, but on account of man not believing in what is very, very simple and then making things very complex. We can then look at scripture and we can look at preaching and teaching. And when all these uh complex errors or these errors that has occurred on account of not believing the simplicity that there is in Christ or moving away from the simplicity that there is in Christ. It might sound very complex, but it is actually not. It is dealing with what is complex on account of the enemy that has been set in people's heart and dealing with all those different aspects and that might be perceived as complex but it's actually very very simple the gospel is so simple Uh, the rule of God that God has always promised which is the rule of life has now come to the earth even if it is the case that people might die we have the promise of life and we simply just rest in God as we believe upon him we find his life born in us and the life that is born in us is the spirit of Christ or the same life that is in Christ and is born in us and we find the attributes that was put on display in the man Jesus is also now put on display in us and we define that as salvation from the fruit of the flesh uh, salvation from the death that's in this world and we can then experience the life of God the simple simple gospel is that God has promised this life and that has started and as we believe upon that the great joy of that and the empowerment of that brings forth who God is in us now um, let us read Ephesians chapter 3 and verse I think I must read from verse 8 for it to make sense. It says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now what Paul is saying is is that he is the least of all the saints. I did discuss this last Sunday and what that means and why it is the case. But that unto him was the grace given, or the life-preserving power, or the enablement or the power or the anointing was given unto him that he should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other words, the riches of Christ that is so much that we would never come to the end of discovering how big, how wide, and how long, and how deep these riches are, but that it should be preached amongst the Gentiles or actually that it is now taking place in the Gentiles as what we would find the rulership of God taking place in the Jewish camp, it's now taking place in the Gentile camp. And as what the people, the Jewish people, where the rule of God was taking place in the Jewish camp, had to believe upon it in order to be saved in the very same way now, as it's taking also place in in the Gentile camp, they have to believe in order to be saved. I'm saying this, and those of you that are may be plagued with universalism, will understand exactly what I am getting at. Right, for those of you that don't get what I was just saying there, don't worry about it. We, continuing, it says here that he was preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles, meaning that the Messiah wasn't there to save Israel from the Gentiles, but The Messiah was there to save Jew and Gentile from the common enemy, which is the devil and death. Now, sadly today, and um, maybe I am very straightforward and some might be offended by this, but even today, the Gentile church struggle with this, that Jesus is the Messiah amongst the Gentiles. What that would mean is that it's a redefinition of who the people of God is, of who Israel is. Now, I want to say something about Israel. We can be so caught up as Christians with what is going on in the Middle East, 
that we are not beholding what is above, which is the life of Jesus, but that we are so beholding what is on the earth, which is the fleshly wars that is going on between Jew and Gentile, uh, and now I say Jew and Gentile from the perspective of the Old Testament view, because in Christ there's no such a thing. Uh, in Christ that Jesus is the Messiah of Gentiles as well, by that making of the two one new people, meaning that the uh, the people that had to become had to be set free is humanity, and then those who believe upon him shall and celebrate his rule, don't make themselves the enemy of Christ, they will experience the life of God. If you want to hear a little bit more about how this works and how we partake of this and how repentance works, please go and listen to my daily devotionals that I've preached this past week, Monday to Friday. It's a 10-minute devotional. Just go to my website and uh, listen to that or to my YouTube page where you will find my daily devotionals, and you can go and listen to this last week's daily devotionals. That would have been from the 22nd of April until the 27th of April. 2024, if you're listening to this maybe a year or two from now. Now, uh, today we struggle with a simple concept in verse 8, where Paul says that he's come to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ amongst the Gentiles. Now, we say that the riches of Christ and Christ being the Messiah and uh, the Jews being the people of God is unsearchable amongst the Jews. But Paul says this is now amongst the Gentiles as well. And then he goes on, it says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery was that the Gentiles was included under the Messiah. Now, when was the Gentiles included under the Messiah? It says here, and let me read it, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. So from the beginning of the world, Jesus Christ was not the Messiah of the Jews, but the Messiah of humanity. The Jews was then used as a type and a shadow of the substance which is in Christ, which is that he's the Messiah of all people. And now today we find people and big ministries all over South Africa and in the U.S. making it their business to try and make the, sub, the, the, the shadow the substance. What happened in Israel, Israel as a nation and all of that is just a shadow of what the true substance is. And we cannot find substance in the shadow. So we need to see that and grapple with that and make it our own. And please get away from this Zionism. It is not and this kind of a uh, Jewish nationalism and all those kind of things. We as Christians, we belong to the kingdom of heaven that is being established on earth. We are of a different place. We are citizens of heaven. And since heaven is now manifesting on earth, we are, as those citizens, not seeing ourselves as citizens of this wo these world systems. And we need to get to that place. I mean, just that verse there, we can talk about that for the whole message. Um, if we think of what the unsearchable riches of Christ is, it talks about the forgiveness of sins. It talks about the recreation of the human body. It talks about the rulership of the spirit. In other words, where the law of life is now overpowering and removing the power of sin and death in our lives, wherein we as a people start to experience heaven on earth, where we are basically the display window of heaven on earth, and we have now immigrated. We are now citizens of heaven, and we are living on earth. And when we look at this whole concept of being citizens of heaven and so forth, we have to read it in its Greco-Roman history, wherein we would find that Rome would send its citizens 
all over different areas, especially their old um, soldiers and so forth. They would go and live in Philippi, for instance, and if they lived there, Rome didn't want them back. They are citizens of Rome, but they're now living in Philippi, and they, the Romans would want Rome now to start to manifest in Philippi, and that Rome would be there. And that is what happens. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. All authority in heaven and earth was given unto him. He then poured out his spirit on earth in us. And we are now the temple of God. We are now the place where heaven and earth collides, where heaven and earth comes together. And we now find that the church is the Israel of God. I want to say this. The church didn't become the Israel of God. The church has always been the Israel of God. The only Israel that was a type and a shadow is the physical nation Israel, which was a type and a shadow of the true Israel, which is the believer. Who is a child of Abraham but he that has the faith of Abraham and believes in Abraham? And we need to understand that, well, I, one day I will preach Romans chapter 19 and 11 and explain those things as I see them. Well, let us, for those of you that are still listening, uh, thank you for that and allowing me to serve you with this good news today. Let us continue. It says, um, and let me read this eight again, unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. should preach to the Gentiles that Christ has been your Messiah and that Christ has always been your Messiah. Jesus Christ didn't become the Messiah of the Gentiles. He's always been the Messiah of the Gentiles. One might say, but Romans 9 and Romans 11 doesn't say that we were grafted in and so forth. That is shadow language. That is what I've explained in the beginning of this message, that once people are confused, then you use the language which is understood by the confused and the lingo of the confused to explain reality. The true reality is what we see in verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, we know the mystery and what it was, uh, which is that Jesus was always the Messiah of all people, this fellowship of the mystery, which was from the beginning of the world and has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I've come to show how Jesus has always been promised to all people and that the people of God that the promise was made to is all of humanity. Those who believe upon them, they are then born of God as the sons of God and they will be led out of death and have life. Verse 10, the intent is that now unto principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, how Jesus is Lord and Messiah of all people and how the wisdom of God, which is Christ, is applied to idol worship, how it's applied to running a nation, how it is applied to running a business, how it's applied to the ending of idol worship, how it is applied in living your life in this earth, how it's applied in being a servant to all people. He says, this is according to the eternal purpose which he has purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So God had an eternal purpose. And the eternal purpose was that he would bring forth his kingdom and his life in this earth. And that through the church, he might make known who and what he is and what it is all about to all powers and principalities. Now, or principalities and powers. Now, when we look at the word principality there, I'm going to read, um, let me read from the Thayer definition. It means a beginning or origin. So he says he wants to make no known unto all beginnings or origins of things, which would mean the person or the thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, or the leader. So he's saying here that God now wants to make known unto all leaders 
and their authority or the powerful influence that they have in the earth. He wants in the heavenly realms or from a position of rulership, he wants to make known unto them by the church what the wisdom of God is. So this principalities means that which anything begins to be, the origin, the active, the active cause. So God wants to show to any active cause and its authority in this world, whatever would cause problems in this world, whatever would be a cause, uh, we can think of the principal thing of democracy or the principal thing of uh, atheism or the principal thing of capitalism or whatever, and then the power it has, the rulership and its authorities and how it has been put in this world. He wants to make known to all of that, that are in the heavenlies, that are rulers in this earth. He wants to make known unto them the wisdom of the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, how God's wisdom applies to them through the church. Remember when it talks about powers in heavenly places, uh, we, are, we, we are not to exclude ourselves from being a power in a heavenly place. And neither should we exclude Christ as a principality. Because if a principality is the first person, as what it means, as what it says here, a person or a thing that commences, isn't Jesus a person that has commenced? Isn't he the person or the thing or, uh, 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 or, or a leader? Jesus is the leader. So Jesus is the principal person. He's the first person. He's the first born from the dead. And he has authority and power. Now, through us is being made known unto the world the wisdom of God, which is to say that we cannot live by our own power and that God is a good God that loves us, that forgives sin, that takes away transgression, that takes away iniquity. Let's make it very practical. The other day I said um, on Facebook, and maybe I should go and read it, but I don't want to waste too much time. But I said, the only answer that there is to the problems in the Middle East, or the ultimate answer to the problems in the Middle East, does not include a gun. Now, many of you might be very upset when I say that and say, I'm a liberal, I'm an anti-gun person and all of that. Get politics out of your mind. And let's just look at scripture. I don't side with any of these parties. I just want to say that I'm a citizen of heaven and I'm speaking the truth of the gospel. And uh, when I make a statement like that, what I'm trying to say is that the true answer is Jesus. Somebody then wrote to me on my Facebook page, and obviously this person did write in kindness, although I could experience some of the frustration in his writing that he has. He says, so should Israel just sit like a sitting duck and be killed and not defend themselves? What should they do? I said, well, this is what I would say to Palestine and Israel and every nation around them, all of Saudi Arabia. This is what I would say to any nation that is involved in any of these wars. This is what you can do. Bow your knee to Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior. To the, go and sell everything and give it to the poor and come and follow Christ. And you will have a treasure in heaven. You will find a life that is born from heaven. You shall be, you shall receive the authority and the power to be called the sons of God. Come to a place where your life is so born from the resurrected Christ that you know that you are the heir of the whole earth anyway. You'll inherit the earth anyway. And you will, you, you come to a place where your life is so enriched with who you are in Christ that you are not a, a taker, but you become a giver where you, your life is so secure in the resurrected Jesus that you will lose your fear of death. That is what I'm saying. Now, some might say, well, that is absurd. That is an ideology. That is something that is not real and practical. Well, go and tell, try and tell that to God. Try and tell that to Jesus. He lived by that. He lived it. He believed it. And 2,000 years ago, the so-called, and please hear what I'm saying, 
idiot logic that Jesus followed, and I'm saying idiotic logic according to the world system, not God, because Jesus was living by the wisdom of God, but according to the world, this idiot, you know, he's being crucified and he doesn't even say anything. Today, he is the effect on his life is seen in the world and cannot die. The power by which he was raised up into is unending. It is called the grace of God to preserve life, wherein we are set free from the fears and the anxieties that is in this world because we are part of a power that is greater than the death in this world where we can live in this world but we are funded from outside of this world hallelujah isn't that powerful that is so so powerful the moment we start to realize that we find that we live in utter peace in this earth we have joy in this world amen because we can live in this world but we can basically say like what jesus christ said he says the son of god or the son of man talking about jesus which is in heaven then he was talking about himself walking on the earth the son of god which is in heaven he's talking about himself living and being seated with god in heavenly places and he was in his life making known unto the powers and principalities of the day in heavenly places talking about all the rulers of the spiritual domains which would be the sanhedrin because they would speak from heaven because since the temple was a place where the people, ancients believe heaven and earth come together and they are the priests and the spokespersons for that place where heaven and earth come together, which would be the same for all these idol worshippers and the worshippers of the different gods with their temples having their priests and the Asclepius having these Sclepians and all of that where they would worship and come for healing like the pool of Bethesda and so forth. All those were rulers in heavenly places speaking for their gods. Jesus came and he made known unto all these powers and all these principles principalities and powers in heavenly places he came to make known the wisdom of god by saying the son of man which is in heaven talking about him while he's walking upon the earth because he's living from heaven we as the church we live like that in the earth and one might say but that is too lofty for us that is something you're living with your mind in the heavens well doesn't the scripture say in colossians chapter 3 be mindful of what is above and not what is on the earth for your life is hidden with God in Christ. Are you, not, are you not living in the true reality as you are seeing your unification and your fellowship, that the fellowship that there is in Jesus Christ? In 1 John, it reads as follows. And um, I, I read from verse 3. 1 John 1 verse 3 says, That which we have seen and have her declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ our koinonia our partnership our participation the word here one of the radical words for that union is intercourse benefaction communication, distribution, fellowship. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Our union is with the Father and with the Son. He says, we've come to make known unto you what we've heard and what we've seen and what our hands have handled, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father. So we find here that the wisdom of God, and you need to understand that the Bible says, um, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, the fear of the Lord means to patiently wait upon the mercy of God. That is what fear means, to expect the mercy of God. That is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of knowing how to walk in this earth is to expect God to be merciful towards you. That mercy would be to give his life to you. Amen. It says here, to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, how the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, applies into every area of life. 
And this is in accordance to the purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faithfulness of him. So it says here that the purpose was that all people groups would have access with confidence, access unto the Father through one spirit. That is what chapter 2 verse 18 says. We have access unto what? Um, let me read. I think it's 2.18 if my memory doesn't fail me. It says, Ephesians 2.17, I have come to preach peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both, that is Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit, which is the spirit of the resurrection, the life of Jesus. Unto the Father, it means that through the life of Christ given to us, we've got access to a place where who we are is born from the Father and not born from the news, not born from circumstances, not born from bad things that happen in this world, although they happen. And we can be amongst these things, but our lives are not born from it. Hallelujah. Our lives are born from Jesus Christ. Amen. He says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So you are now of the household of God, the very temple of God. So God has determined that he would bring forth his presence in this earth through the man Jesus, and he will pour out his presence in the body of Jesus, which is the church, and then he will make his wisdom, his way of living, which is called the way of the Lamb, known to all of us. I don't know if I mentioned in my previous Sunday message, but if my memory doesn't fail me, I think the, the way of the Lamb, or Jesus as the Lamb, is referred to, I think it's 25 or 28 times in the book of Revelation, and then refers to a Lamb as if he's slain yet standing. What that means is that Jesus Christ followed the wisdom of God, which is to believe upon God the Father, wherein the Father promised him that he will make him Lord over the earth, through whom salvation will be available to all people, and that he promised Jesus eternal life. Jesus lived from that revelation in this earth, and they murdered him. And he did nothing but trust the Father. That is what he did. Now, just a little bit about persecution to ease your mind here, because we might say, well, should we just be sitting ducks or whatsoever? The Bible says if you find persecution, flee. Run from persecution. If you see here is persecution, then make sure, I mean, I call it persecution management. There are many things that I could say, in a much more radical way, but I'm fleeing persecution without compromising the truth, still speaking the truth, but speaking it in a way that people over a long period of time can, can start to grab a hold of it and see it because the Lord has revealed many of these things to me over a long period of time. And he eased me into it. Uh, and uh, it was one concept built on another one, built on another one, to the point that I've now come to the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity that there is in Christ. So when we look at this, we have to come to the understanding that the purpose that there is in Jesus Christ was that Christ would believe upon him, Christ, to a certain degree, managed, managed persecution. We find that when he would be at certain places and send his disciples and he would stay away. And the Bible says he would go through the crowd, go to another place and so forth. We would find Peter and Paul and all of them managing persecution. So you use, uh, use your brain, you know, uh, manage your persecution. Just don't, you don't have to go and head out all out for death. You don't have to do that uh, when it comes to persecution and, and those kind of things. No, we, we manage that persecution. We look at it and we veer away from it. Like Jesus says, when you, when you see persecution flee, but if you're pushed into a corner, 
Denying the Lord is not an option. Then we rather take it, then we take the bullet, and we'll, ra- we'll be raised in a better resurrection. We'll have a better life. That is the way we look at it. But as for me, I manage my persecution. I use as much wisdom as what I can, staying alive as long as possible to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm not saying we cannot defend ourselves in a certain, in a certain way. Yet, what I'm saying is that the way of the Lamb is the way wherein Jesus was slain and the Father raised him from the dead. And there's one verse in the New Testament that talks about the line of the tribe of Judah. Yet we find hundreds of messages which is about the line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was a meek little lamb that cannot do anything wrong when, and, and harm anybody when he was on the earth. But now you need to understand when he returns, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and he's going to tear people to pieces and he's coming to destroy. And the way he's going to destroy is he's now going to uh, 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 use certain nations, fund them, help them to make atom bombs and cannons and kill a a lot of people around the earth to preserve a certain nation. That's now the line of the tribe of Judah. That is absurd. That is anti-Christ, demonic and devilish teaching. It's not from God. You might say, that if you say that, you're not really managing your persecution. Well, I live in South Africa and, uh, you you know, I think... It's safe enough for me to say what I'm saying here. Let me tell you, we cannot be at that absurd place where we think the line of the tribe of Judah is an angry Jesus that wants to fund people to go to war. If he was the one that was on the earth when they asked him, should we call down fire from heaven to destroy these people? Then Jesus says, you do not know what spirit you are of. And Jesus didn't go to heaven to have a change in spirit. No, the lion of the tribe of Judah is the slain lamb. What roars and what has power and what rules and what devours the kingdoms of this world is the lamb that was slain whom God raises. Hallelujah. And that's how we live in our own life. Let's make it practical with with things that you might struggle with in your own personal life. If you struggle with certain things in your life, The best way to overcome that is to humble yourself before God in saying, God, I by my power cannot be victorious over this problem in my life. Let's say it's pride. Let's say it is to think of yourself as secure on account of the stability that you have because of your pension fund that is full of money. Or you are secure because you have now bought 10 houses and you're renting them out and there's security and all of that. And now you want to say, God, I'm really dependent upon you. But you find that your mind all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all the time runs to the security that there is in this world. And should they be tampered with that security a little bit, your life falls apart. Don't be full of pride. Right there, confess and say, Lord, I want to come to you. I'm not going to carry this burden to find security in if this thing works or doesn't work. I find my security in you alone. And I come to you now and I behold your spirit of life. And by your spirit of life, I've got access to a life that's born from the Father. I believe upon you. You rule over this. I am secure. Even all of the funds that there is available in the world cannot secure one person's life. It says in Psalm, I think it's 49, the life of a person is expensive. No riches can purchase that life. Even all the rich go into the grave and their followers. But we in Christ have access to life. Amen. And if we start to live like that and we see this 80 or 90 years we live live on this earth um, and then we find that we our, our bodies we die and we see the resurrection we don't see it even as 
a change of anything. We just see that it is a continuation because we'll be raised and we find the life of God. We will live in this earth as victors, even while we are seeing God bring forth what is promised in this earth. Hallelujah. So God had an eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faithfulness of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at the tribulation for you, which is your glory. So Paul says, listen, I'm going through persecution now. I'm going through tribulation for you. And now you're seeing what I'm going through. I don't want you to throw away everything that you have learned. Keep believing this. I'm praying and I'm bowing my knee that you might understand what I have for you. Now, before I go to chapter 3, verse 14, we'll jump into that in our next service. I think I'm going to chapter 1 quickly, and we're just recapping on what this unsearchable riches is that is in Christ that we have received. Um, we're just going back and uh, just looking a little bit at uh, what this manifold wisdom of God is that God has purposed before the foundation of the world. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Where has he blessed us with his spiritual blessings? He's blessed us with spiritual blessings, which mean unending, undying blessings. He's blessed us in the earth. How? In that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, set apart from death, that is what holy would mean, and without blame before him in love. In other words, that we would be his people born from his life, full of love in this world, following the way of the Lamb, following the way of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which roars in being a lamb that was slain reigning in the throne of God. Do you know that the Bible says that in the midst of the throne, God saw a lamb? Do you know that that the power from which God rules in the earth is the power of the slain lamb, the power of God preserving your life by God, even if you die, raising you from the dead, giving you eternal life. And now God ruling in the earth in the church and through Jesus in the church in preserving our lives from the world in bringing forth a heavenly life in us by his doing. Now, everything that I have said, I want to tell you, you cannot have access to that by the works of the law. It is impossible. It is a gift of heaven. It is the kingdom of heaven manifesting in the earth. There is a devil that wants to manifest his wisdom in the world, which is self-preservation. You preserve your own life. The, and, and you continue along the lines. My, my neighbor, let's say my neighbor is afraid of me. I don't think any of my neighbors is afraid of me. But let's say my neighbor is afraid of me. The only way that, I, that he can be saved from fear of me is by seeing my love. The more scared he is of me, the more dangerous he becomes. The more loving I am, the more peaceful my neighbor will become. But the wisdom of the world says the more loving you are, the more he's going to abuse you and he's going to murder you. You need to be scared of him. Then as you are scared of him and he's scared of you, you get to a place where you are so on the edge when it comes to each other, that you, you are always, always at breaking point, armed to the teeth, ready to destroy the other one, where you study the personality of the other one all the time, wherein you then have come to the conclusions that each one is a narcissist and a psychopath and all those kind of things. And if he does anything wrong, let, let us rather kill him before he kills us. And all of that is born from living outside of the way of the Lamb, the way of Jesus. God has come to give you his life. And when I mean, what I mean by he's come to give you his life, he's come to give you eternal life and he's come to give you the way Jesus lived and bring that forth in your life. We see that in Stephen. 
We see that in Paul. We see that in Peter. We see that in all the martyrs. We see that in the early church. A humble people that love others who was abused by people, but even if they were abused, they loved on people because their life was not born from this world. For they knew that their lives could not be destroyed. Not even physically could their lives be destroyed because even if they die, they'll be raised never to die for they are the possessors of eternal life. So even their flesh had peace because of their union with God in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Isn't that absolutely powerful? Well, we've come to the end of our message. And uh, next Sunday's message will be a message that I've preached at a friend of mine, uh, Danny von Weyck in Nelspreet, that I will stream if everything goes well with that recording. Please note that these recordings are all pre-recorded. I'm sitting here on a Monday. If you say back, you know, I see you've got the same jersey on for the whole week. No, it's just that the whole week's messages and the Sunday message and the next Sunday message is just made on one morning where I preach everything in one setting. Uh, if the honest message comes out well, um, the recording of those kind of things, we will stream that next week. And then from there on, we will have other recordings that I make because I'm on my way to Zambia. I think by the time you listen to this, I will be at Donish Church and uh, Ilya and I, we are on our way to Zambia and we will be leaving, I think, about the 7th of May. But we have to make pre-recordings because I'm not here on Sundays and that is what you're listening to. So, uh, well, thank you then uh, for allowing me to serve you with the good news. Make sure that you check our Facebook if you are interested in following us on, on our trip to Zambia and what we're going to do there. We're just going to uh, held there with a basic election of a new board and then preaching in some churches. We're not having any plans as pertaining to building projects and those kind of things. We're just going for preaching and that election. Then we're going to be back by the end of May if everything goes well. And now we're my first service that I will be preaching again from the studio being back, if everything goes well, will be, I think, the 10th of June the 10th of June. Thank you so much for supporting our ministry, loving on us, sharing these messages, always encouraging me uh, in what these messages mean to you. We will talk again next Sunday. God bless.